Here we are, folks. I on the Illini, Mike Kegley. And we have a, a real treat here today. We have Stephen Bardo. Of course, folks know he's an Illini legend on the 1989 Flying Illini team that us older folks think was the biggest, the best Illinois team of all time. And I I had to actually talk to Stephen before the interview because I had to get a list of everybody that he broadcasts with. You can see him on Fox Sports, BTN, NBC, the Chicago Sky WNBA, Westwood One Radio. And of course, I think the one that, that people also have been finding in this new day, Bardo Media, your YouTube channel, and that's where you have Bardo's Breakdown, which is a live show every Monday at 5 p.m. Central Time. Yep. So, Stephen, do you have any free time? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I do. It, it seems busy. It seems like a lot, but the majority of those responsibilities are obviously during college basketball season. I'm doing about 15 Chicago Sky WNBA games it, it breaks up the summer nicely it keep, keeps you sharp keeps you focused and obviously i've been doing the chicago sky off and on for about the last 10 years and to see the growth of the league with caitlin clark coming in has been it's going to be fun this season yeah i have to ask you because this one I, I wasn't even prepared for but has it shocked you how these these existing WNBA players, the vitriol that Caitlin Clark gets? To me, it's like a rising tide will raise all ships. I'm shocked at how they get so frustrated sometimes by her, or at least they seem there seems to be an animus in some of these interviews that I just haven't heard before. Yeah, I, I think it's there's some enviousness that we've seen because of the numbers that she's bringing in, the contracts. I think she just signed a deal with Wilson Basketball. She's got her own line of basketballs. I think she had a, a, another endorsement deal, and then the league is rolling out certain things. But I watched the Chicago Fever host the Connecticut Sun last night, and Gamebridge was packed. Yes. It was capacity on national television. That just has not happened in women's basketball until Caitlin Clark. And so there's going to be some enviousness among players in the WNBA that have been there, that have been veteran. But as you said, all ships rise in this scenario. And she's a good, she's a really good player. It's going to take time for her to adjust to the speed and the strength of the game, but she's going to be a really good player. And so it's going to be fun to watch her maturation. And I think she'll shut the naysayers up in, in due time. I also think in the WNBA, the rookies really have it tough yep. because three weeks before the, if you go deep in the tournament, you got about two or three weeks before the draft and then two or three weeks you're starting again. I've got to think that for a college player, that's probably the time they're just starting to get their legs back. And now you're elevating your play against the 144 best women in the world. That has to be a major undertaking. I don't care if you're Caitlin Clark or Angel Reese or anybody. Oh, it's definitely tough on, on the body. And the thing with that most people don't know about women's basketball is that the majority of players in the WNBA play overseas during the traditional basketball season. So they don't get a lot of time off and they are playing year round most of the time. That's why sometimes you'll see a player, they just have to take a year off because yep. their bodies are worn out emotionally. They're wore out psychologically they're just they're tapped and so these ladies laid on the line man and they I, I respect them I love calling their games and I just I appreciate the effort and the tenacity in which they play yeah there, there's no doubt and I know there's people who are listening to this shaking their head going just trying to be politically correct but I will tell you that it is uh, the athleticism on the court I'll tell there's a lot of I was a pretty good basketball player when I was young I wouldn't want any part of any of these ladies because oh, they're man. good I'm telling you, and what I tell people all the time, how I got into women's basketball, my sister is five years older than me, and she used to wear me out until I got almost up to high school. I couldn't beat her, and so I have great respect for the women's game, and to see the way that my sister played compared to now as athletic and as strong as these ladies are, just to watch the maturation of the game has been fun. Yeah, that, that's a, it's an incredible thing, and of course, folks, if you're listening to this, uh, the Illini guy's own Larry Smith is on the pregame show on Ion TV every right. Friday night. 
That's right. So you got to check your local listings. If you have YouTube TV, if you have direct TV, you can actually get that pregame show and you can set it up to record each week. But Larry there with Megan and Autumn and look, it's obvious he's suffering up there with these two fantastic athletes who are also very attractive women. So it, it's a great show. And if you get a chance to watch, you're going to be surprised how good these gals are. I agree. I totally agree. So to, to switch topics, we talk all the time. And as Illini fans, who's the best Illini team of all time? Now, you have a point of view that's biased because you were on what many of us feel is the greatest Illini team of all time. But at Illini guys, we've had several events where we can, we get Kenny battle arguing with D Brown over who's better or Marcus Griffin shows up and says, Hey, we don't get any respect because we got too many fouls called on us in the tournament. I'm not asking you to tell us which team is the best team. But can you give me a few bullet points that, that a fan of the 89 team would use to support their case? Okay. I was the defensive player of the year in the Big Ten at 6'6". Kendall was the number five pick in the NBA draft at 6'5". So if you look in the backcourt, and then let's just throw Nick Anderson in there at 6'5". Okay? Yep. <clears throat> Darren Williams would have his way with anybody. Okay. Darren Williams was a stud one of the best players to ever play. If you are going to go heads up with the point guard position, he wins it against me every time. No, no doubt. Who is D Brown going to guard? Yeah. That's a question, right? D was electrifying on the offensive end. I could slow him down, but on the defensive end, is he going to guard Nick Anderson <laughs> at six, yeah. five, two twenty five, or is he going to guard Kendall Gill at six, five, two fifteen? Like, I don't see that happening. I don't see Luther Head being able to guard Kendall Gill or Nick Anderson. Just the, the positional size that we had, I think, would overwhelm that 2005 team. I, I think Roger Powell was an outstanding undersized four, but do you really think that he could go heads up with Kenny Battle? Yeah, yeah. On both sides of the floor. He's a better shooter than Kenny, but – Pretty much everything else, I think Kenny might have had an, a slight advantage on. And I'd give James Augustine an advantage, even over Lowell Hampton, who I love to play with. But James was just bigger, athlete, more athletic, and I think a little bit more skilled than Lowell. So if you're just going, if you're looking at the starting fives of the two teams, that's how I break things down from a size perspective in the backcourt. I think we would definitely have an advantage. And I think Kenny Battle would have an advantage over Roger Powell up front. So there you are, folks. If you need to argue this, you got the bullet points there, which I agreed with each one. I love the 0405 team. I do as um, well. I, fantastic. But I, I think the 89 team has a little bit of an advantage. And, and since Marcus Griffin isn't here, we're not going to, we're just going to make him mad and not mention him, but we'll have to have him on on a podcast and he can argue his case for his era. Now, the only other team that I think is interesting, this year's team was a very interesting team because you had some athleticism and some size, a little bit of a blend. Mm -hmm. And then I also wonder, and I know they didn't do well, but I think part of it's the COVID year and the, the endless days in hotels. But I do think the Kofi team would give almost anybody trouble because Kofi will tend to to foul out many players on the other team. Now, Io and Kofi are only two players. You maybe throw Trent Frazier in there, but I think you guys would probably overwhelm them just on the sheer number. But Kofi might be able to foul some guys out. Yeah, with Kofi, we dealt with Dwayne Shenses. You guys remember the seven-footer from Florida. We, Our speed and quickness just overwhelmed him. And I yep. think that – a lot of times, bigs feel uncomfortable when they're playing against undersized guys. So we may have given Kofi. He probably gave us some fits, too, but I think we could have maybe ran his tongue out, ran him up and down the floor yep. a little bit and taken advantage of him that way. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. But he's just the X factor. I, oh, no doubt. I still think the biggest, not the biggest, but one of the biggest what-ifs of Illinois basketball is what if he had better advisors who had told him to stick around for a couple of years take the NIL checks 
and see what you could do. Would have been interesting to see what that team would have looked like with a couple more years of Kofi, especially if he actually had a year that he worked on things in the off season, but we'll never know. So you've had, you're roughly the same age as me, maybe a year younger. You've watched the Illini basketball program over 40 years, and you've obviously been a key part of it, and you've been able to sit as a broadcaster right there and bring that into our homes. What does this resurgence under Brad Underwood, what does that elicit in you in terms of emotions, and how do you analyze it? Because we had that dead spot from the last three years of the Weber era through the Gross era that was hugely painful. Yes. At, How do you put Brad Underwood and what he's built into perspective in the long run? When I look at what Brad's been able to accomplish with the changing landscape of college basketball, all the changes that have taken place, we had the COVID situation, and he's still able to attract major talent to Champaign, like Bill Self. You look back at Lou Henson, who he was able to attract. Bill Self was able to attract some outstanding talent. Brad Underwood is right there. And when you take the best attributes of the 80s and the you know the early 90s, the self years, I think Brad has got a mix of all of that. He's been able to not only get top talent to Champagne, but he and his staff really develop players. Terrence Shannon, when he first came to Champagne, he was not shooting the basketball like he finished this yep. this past season. He wasn't as strong. He was always big, but he got even stronger at Illinois. When you look at Sumu, Ayo DeSumu could barely wipe his behind with his left hand when he first came to Illinois. He worked his tail off to make himself into a pro. And Brad Underwood not only attracts top talent, but they develop that talent into a cohesive unit. His ability to get guys like Marcus Domask, Quincy Garrier, to buy into a singular vision and got them to an elite eight game against the eventual national champions. I don't know the Illini fans really understand how special this past season was. I recall Josh Whitman and me were in Boston before the UConn game, and we had a chance to speak to a bunch of alums out there. And the thing that I wanted to stress to them is like, guys, take this in. These are the glory days of Illinois basketball. I know I could get in trouble for saying that, but I think it's true. We've not been as a program, this program has not been this consistent this long. I, I think Bill Self would have done that, but right. if, you, if you recall, he left to Kansas. Lou Henson had great times, but then he had lulls as well. Brad Underwood has got this thing to a certain level, and it has not dropped off. Year after year, they figured out different ways. And so I think this is, line I fans should look at this as maybe some of the glory years of Illinois basketball and what Brad Underwood has been able to accomplish at this university, I think has been very impressive. Yeah, I, I agree. And and I remember self's last year going into the assembly hall. I believe it was still the assembly hall in those days. Yeah. And I, I remember walking in with my father and saying to him, we got to appreciate this because it, it won't last because Bill self every year you heard he might be going somewhere. Yep. Whereas with Brad Underwood, Maybe I'm maybe I have a false sense of security, but you feel like he wants to stay and build it here. And I think that to me is the difference between Underwood and Self is Self had that wanderlust of Kansas and some of these other things. And Brad Underwood, at least until he proves differently, seems to be very desirous of building what he can in Champaign Urbana and not starting over somewhere else. Yeah, you make you bring up a great point. And and here's some things I want folks to think about. With Bill Self, Illinois didn't have the leadership that it has now. Josh Whitman is a superstar of an athletic director. He is an excellent fundraiser. He gets it. I love the way that he goes about his hiring processes. You don't hear a bunch of rumors. All of a sudden there's a coach hired. Yep. And it's a good coach, a really good coach. So Bill Self didn't have the leadership and the vision in the Illinois Athletic Department then that Josh Whitman has instilled now. So I think that's a big difference because with that leadership, they would have understood that Bill Self is one of the best coaches in the country. You have to pay 
a guy to keep him at home because he is a big, he's a big eight guy. That's his, his roots were in the big eight, the now big 12, yep. his roots were in the big eight. So if there was a Kansas that was going to come calling, if you don't match or try to get close to what Kansas is going to offer, he's going to go. So the, the difference now is that Brad Underwood, when he got the Illinois job, he was an assistant at Western Illinois for nine years. He knew that at the University of Illinois, you can win a national championship. He knew the background of Illinois being the 11th winningest basketball program in the country. He understood the alumni base, the, the amount of money that could be generated when this thing gets rolling. And now he's got it rolling, and now you're starting to see the NIL come in and the talent starting to follow. So I think the difference between Bill Self and what Brad Underwood is undertaking right now is that Underwood has got the backing, he's got the support, he's got the leadership that's necessary to bring a national championship to Champaign. I think Bill Self would have had the opportunity to do that if there was different leadership. And I think that's those are the differences right there. And that's why I think Brad Underwood feels very much at home in Champaign because he knows he can win a national championship here. I, I totally agree. And <laughs> nobody wants to see me go on one of my Ron Gunther rants. So we'll save you that. How you can be an athletic director and be sub 400 winning percentage in your football program is beyond me. And when Bill Self left, because you had heard comments from above about how Bill was a great value as a coach in terms of where he was ranked uh, in, in coaches in terms of compensation was much lower than the where he was ranked in wins. And I would hear those comments. And yeah, I was not a happy camper when he left because it should have never happened. But now we got Brad Underwood, so everything is fine. Josh Whitman has done a really good job. He's got to corral that, uh, figure out what the football team needs. But that's a discussion that's a much tougher one, as we all know, as Illini fans. Although we have David Williams on last week, he'll eloquently talk about Illini football. But that's, even with Brett Bielma, we've got an improved level of performance in the football arena that Illinois hasn't had since John Makovic. So you're going in the right direction and the leadership has to be there to allow that to happen. I think that's I a great point. So we talked a little bit about Brad Underwood. You're in a position where you can watch the roster building here this year. And, and, and Illinois is going to come back with very thin from a, a elite eight team in terms of returning players. That's a different way of doing things, but it's a different paradigm with NIL and the transfer portal than it has been in the past. And this is the last year that the COVID eligibility people will be out there. Mm -hmm. I, I keep telling people that you really can't judge the roster building that's going on right now in May of 2024 until April of 2025 when we see how the tournament comes out. Sure. But understanding that we're in the middle of it, what are your thoughts right now as a former player and as a as an announcer who covers these teams year in and year out? What do you think of that? From an announcer standpoint, let me start with that. I, I think that Illinois has flipped their roster in an impressive fashion to have, like you just said, a, have an elite eight run and then not really be able to retain a lot of those guys for various reasons. Right. Chester Frazier goes to West Virginia. He takes a few with him. Guys want to get to the next level. The eligibility is up. Various reasons. I think Brad Underwood's background as a junior college coach, having to blend players and build chemistry very quickly, he does the speed dating thing at the college basketball level as well as any coach in America. I think he's proven that. So I know Illini fans get a little nervous when there's no, you don't have a lot of definites coming back. Everybody right. loves Ty Rogers. Everybody understands that your Gibbs Lawhorn has tremendous upside. But outside of that, these guys, are they're new to, to the fan base. And so I think that what Brad has been able to do, and I know they're still looking for a dynamic wing. Yeah, I'm sure they've got their eye on a bunch of different people, but I think he's done a really good job. And I think there's high expectations in this program as it should be. And it's just going to take time for people to see how things blend. Now, from a player's perspective, from a former player's perspective, it's a little tough to watch. I, and here's why. When it's a brethren, when you get a chance to wear this jersey, 
This is yep. really special. It's not, and this is my original jersey, by the way. It's very special to wear that jersey. And so you come into a brotherhood, and it's tough to watch guys that you grow up have an affinity towards and you get to know a little bit that they leave, right? And now you got to try to learn some other guys and will they have the desire? Do they understand how, where they are, wh what it means to put the block eye on your chest? Do they under, do they really understand that? And from a, from an analyst perspective, I think they've done a really good job from a former player's perspective. It's a little, it's not frustrating. It's just, uh, it requires a little bit more of us to extend ourselves to these newer players to get to understand and to get to know them and start pulling for them because you root for guys that you know and you yeah. like. And so it's a little it's a little funny between the two. I can bounce between the two very easily. The interesting part to me is the transactional nature of college mm -hmm. sports is it, it's totally been set on its head. I think it'll probably be probably be set aright a little bit when they get the court case done and probably end up with some sort of labor agreement, to be honest with you, that will have better rules than the none that are right out there now. But to me, the fact that it's, it comes down to many times just how much money and, mm -hmm. and nothing more and nothing less. And I know that's not, I know that, that look, coaches leave and they go for generally for more money, bigger program. And with only two to 3% of college players going on to the NBA, the dollars that you make in NIL and college can be life-changing. I would, I think about my sons who were not college athletes, but if one of them could have made a million dollars over four years in college and they come away with, let's say 300,000 by the time you pay taxes and whatever else you buy is if they walked out with 300,000, they get a down payment on a house at their first job because they're not going to be an NBA player. I, on one hand, I can, it's too transactional. It makes me feel uncomfortable. On the other hand, I can't blame somebody for doing something that could financially change their life for years to come. Yeah. I think that the nature of the shifting landscape puts a lot of fans at odds with the players, but the fans, I want to encourage them to be at odds with the NCAA because they kept the, I don't know, the amateurism piece in place for so long. And they created these narratives for so long that people got brainwashed. College basketball fans, college sports fans got brainwashed into thinking that, oh no, this is the right system. No, it's not. It's, it was never the right system in my opinion. And so if what better way to teach college students how to gain in your work? Like when I'm going to, I'm trying to be very careful how I say this. Yeah. Yeah. When you go to college, I'm a four year graduate of university of Illinois. I've not been asked one time what I took in college, what classes that I took, but what I am asked, what did you learn at Illinois? And I learned a lot, yep. but a lot of it were, was not in the classroom. And so if I was able, if Kendall Gill was able, if Nick Anderson was able to benefit from our labor and turn that labor into uh, revenue for ourselves and then have to learn how to handle that revenue at a college level before you get out here in the world, I think that's a wonderful learning experience. Not only are you being, you're benefiting from your labor, the university is benefiting from your labor and your skill. Everybody wins. But now that we, we things have been shifted so abruptly because they had to, it, the college athletes have to benefit from this system. And now they're starting to, as, as you said, things will, they'll come to the middle. I think there'll be some legislation in place. There'll be some things put in place. But I love the fact that these college athletes, and I don't care what sport it is, if you can benefit from your skill and your labor, from the 18 years or the 15 years that you put in advance to get here, to make you attractive for University of Illinois to procure your services. I, I don't see anything wrong with it. I, I, I totally agree with you. And I go back to, again, my days in college in the late 80s. To me, you look at, you should have been able to make some money whenever a 35 got sold for Illini basketball. I agree. It, because I agree. they were buying your name. Uh, Brian Bosworth, when a 44 got sold for Oklahoma, he should have got that. And if you would have done that, and then just allowed players 
to make some money on local advertising. Yes. If if somebody at Papa Dell's saw you in there and said, you know what, I want Stephen Bardo to, to do our ads here for this year. And you make a little, I'm not talking about you making millions, but you make a little bit of money to go into your pocket. You're getting sure. some money from that. And and then maybe a sliver of the TV and, and ticket rights go to the players where they get a few thousand a month. I think they would have, they, they, all this could have been avoided. I totally agree. And, and see, that's the nature that you're speaking of. You're speaking of equity. Yes. Giving the college athletes equity in their skill and labor. I think that's what you're talking about. And so it would have been nice had that been available when we were in college, but it wasn't. And people ask me all the time, are you jealous? Are you upset that you didn't get NIL? I'm not personally because I've, my NIL is through the networks. Yes. I know, I'm taking I, all that <laughs> knowledge and the name that I was able to build at Illinois and help be on one of the most popular teams in Big Ten history. I'm getting my NIL right now. Personally, I'm fine. And I, I love the fact that these athletes are getting this opportunity. I just hope, heck, that they take advantage of it and not blow the, these financial uh, opportunities. Yeah, so do I. That's where I get so frustrated because whoever Kofi's advisors were, if he had two more years of, let's just use a, a fun number. I'm not saying this is accurate number, but if he could have earned a million dollars on NIL for a fourth and a fifth year, because he would have had a COVID year, mm -hmm. putting that money into a bank account, whether he plays pro overseas, whether he makes it somehow in the NBA, whether he never plays again, that's life changing. And he earned it by, by, cause I'll tell you what, when people paid tickets, they wanted to watch Kofi dunk the basketball. Yes. They wanted to see what he had to do. And ever since I was a very, if you're the same age as me, baseball had two or three strikes. The NFL had strikes. And I kept thinking to myself, if you just pay the players, you don't have to worry about this because I didn't, as, as growing up as a cowboy fan, I didn't turn on the TV to watch bum bright the owner of the Cowboys, I turned on the TV to watch Tony Dorsett, Roger Staubach. Yes. That's, that's and so right. to me, it's okay, pay the players. And and I think now the pro sports have got it figured out. Now it's incumbent upon the, the college sports to find some sense of equity and treat, treat these people equitably for their contributions. I agree. Seems easy enough. All yeah. right. Now I'm going to ask you the tough question that, that I get from Illini guys, subscribers. They say, Steve Bardo bends over backwards to be so fair to the Illini that he's unfair to the Illini and he actually is harder on them than Robbie Hummel is on Purdue. Now, you can't control the Robbie Hummel component of this, but th that's the argument that we get all the time on our boards. I'm not saying it's credible. I'm not saying it's not credible, but you're in the shoes. You played four years arguably maybe the, the the best four years of the Illini basketball program, but you played here during a high point. You're doing your the best to broadcast a game. How do you come to a, a balance so that the fans who are, let's say, from Purdue, who are watching you broadcast a Purdue-Illinois team game, don't feel like you're giving an unfair benefit of the doubt to the Illini? And how do you make sure you don't go overboard on the other end, because that's a question that people have all the time. Yeah. That, and it's funny that when I used to hear that, it would bother me. But now when I do hear that, it, I smile because it's an example of the passion that college basketball fans have. Yep. The Illini fan base is as passionate as any in the country. And you want that in our business, in the media, you want passionate fans. And so if they feel like I bend over backwards and I'm not fair with the Illini, that's fine. Cause that's a sign of passion among the fan base. Here's the thing that people don't realize is that I have two sons. And if my sons are playing a game, you would not know that they were my sons unless you saw the, the name on the back of the Jersey, because I can call a game and I can be very down the middle with them. There's a guy named Dan steer that used to be the coordinating producer at ESPN. And he saw something in me early on. And he put me on an Illinois-Iowa game early in my career. I couldn't believe I got it. It was yep. over in Iowa City. And he said, Stephen, you did a really good job. You only said we twice. 
when I was talking about the Illini. Yep, I got he it. Said, he said, but you did a really good job of staying down the middle. He said, I know it's going to be hard, but it, it once you master this, he said, you're going to have a great career. So fast forward, I, I'll give these, I'll give Illini fans a story. I'm in Maryland. I, just, I called Maryland, I believe it was Minnesota the night before, and I'm getting ready to leave. I get a call, and it's Robbie Hummel. And Robbie Hummel's almost in tears. And I'm like, man, what's going on? He said, Bardo, how do you handle the Illinois fans when you call an Illinois game, man? He said, the Purdue fans are crushing me. He said, they don't understand, Stephen. I tore my knee and came back, and I, I bled for that school. I, I blood, sweat, and tears. I said, Robbie, here's the thing, bro. Fans are short for fanaticals. They're passionate about their fan base, man. And so if you're if fans think that when Stephen Bartle calls a game for the University of Illinois, Illini fans think Stephen Bartle should be pulling for Illinois. Stephen Bartle's color right now is green. It ain't orange and blue. <laughs> it's green. I like greenbacks. I like to get paid for a job well done. Now, if Illinois is playing Purdue or if Illinois is playing Ohio State has moms as well. They have parents that are watching the game as well. They have family members watching the game as well. I'm doing them a disservice if I'm a homer for Illinois every time I come on the air. I wouldn't be working these networks if I was a homer. That's one of the things that has have allowed me to progress in my career. So I'd smile when I hear that Illini fans do that. And that some fans just aren't happy when I'm calling Illinois games. I don't. I can't do anything about that. And I've let that. I've let that go. I've let that burden go of trying to. Oh man, I'm an Illini. That uh, my my work, my history. It speaks for itself. And I just I like the fact that the Illini fan base is one of the most passionate in college basketball. It, and I love it. Yeah, in, in the Big Ten. You and I talk about this a little bit. Here at Illini Guys, we do the Illini Guys Sports Spectacular. That radio show is on Fridays or Saturdays across Illinois on over 20 stations. And and we are Illini Guys, so we will pull for that. We also do a Big Ten show called Big Sports Radio where we have to to dial that back a little bit. Yep. I will say that in that role, I still think the Illini fans, as crazy as Illini fans are, I got to put Indiana fans as the most fanatical. And then I think Purdue, I got to give Purdue fans their game. They have elevated to where they're right with the Illini. Yep. And then in, at least in basketball, and you got Michigan state coming up right there behind. Um, but for me, when I watch and I go out there and I post stuff, I'll get, I get the most feedback from Indiana fans and then Purdue fans. They, they, they generally will come after me a little bit. So I don't, I don't uh, know what that I don't know what that means, but that's just what I see out there. Well, now, go ahead. Go, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Finish. Do you follow? Because everybody tells me, oh, I never read anything on Twitter. I don't care what people say. Do you look at Twitter? Do you ever look at those type of feedbacks and just? I'm not saying it changes your behavior, but you just go, whoa. <laughs> I don't really look at it like that. I mean, sometimes people will at you, and then I, it's funny. Bob was choosing years ago showed me how to check Twitter to see who's talking about you just to put your name in a search. I don't want to do all that because the Twitter can be a, a, a tough place at times. It could be a critical place. And I think a lot of times you'll see the loud minority, right? More so than the majority of that fan base. You get a loud minority. Indiana's good for that. They've got a few loud minority contributors on Twitter. that are very aggressive and very active. And I don't really get too deep in the muck with that. And when, I was telling Robbie Hummels, Robbie, man, when you call a game, don't go on Twitter after the game. Don't do it. Give yourself time to decompress from the game because we generally have to call a game and then we hurry up and go get something to eat or maybe we eat before the game and then you got to try to get down or you got to do some more prep for the next day. So we're on a hamster. We're on a treadmill. We're yeah. just going. But if you stop after a game and you look at what people are saying about you on Twitter, you're going to always have a bad night, always, because there, people can nitpick about anything. And so that's what I do. I'll call a game, and I don't go on Twitter to see what people are saying. I'm going on Twitter for information. I'm right. trying to keep up with all the stuff that we got to keep up with all these teams. And so I try to give myself that night where I'm not – I don't go on Twitter. 
I, I do, I'll go and do my research or whatever. And I'll leave Twitter alone. And then the next day when I'm refreshed and it's a new day, then I'll go on Twitter to look and, and find the information I need. And I'll see people who at me or say, man, Bartos at S or it, I laugh now. It used to bother me like it bothers Robbie Hummel a little bit, but after a while you get used to it and you understand it. You, I'd rather have people talking about me than not. Yeah. I'd rather have people passionate and, and saying, Hey, we don't like the way Bartle does things because that means they're watching. And so that's the main thing that we want. We want these passionate fans to continue to watch night in and night out. Yeah. And look, let's face it. Howard Cosell made a career of people tuning in to hope to get angry about what he said. And you look at Dallas Cowboy football when they used to be good as many people would tune in to watch him lose as win, and Notre Dame was the same way. It means you've made it if you actually get that level of criticism. I agree. I totally yeah, that's agree. that's good. So you've got your YouTube channel that you have, Bardo Media, so people can go out to YouTube. They can subscribe to that. They can obviously uh, follow you on Twitter as well, and so they can keep up with what you're doing. And Bardo's Breakdown is on Mondays, 5 p.m. Central, you can get on there and and actually, if you get lucky, you might be able to get question answered and really be a part of the show. What, what do you see? Where do you see? How are you progressing your career here? And are there any changes that you think are coming up? Anything that people should be watching as you're on like 9,000 different media outlets? Anything career-wise that people should keep an eye on? I'm in a really good space right now with NBC coming on board and them selecting Robbie and me to be the main analysts along with our responsibilities with Big Ten Network and Fox Sports. I'm, I can't, I, I didn't, I never fathomed being able to be in this position to where you really got the, outside of ESPN, you got the top four networks that cover college basketball in, a, in addition to Westwood One Radio. I, I'm ecstatic with where I am. I really want to grow Bardo Media, and I've got a, a basketball community called Bardo's Tribe.com that people can go to and join. And to my knowledge, it might be one of the few Big Ten college basketball-centric communities out there, and that's what I'm really trying to grow, if you really want to be honest. I'm trying to grow that side because that's where everything is right now. It's not really, it's not really cable networks anymore. It's really – uh, on online presence. And if you notice everybody that is big in television media right now, they have their own podcast, they have their own show because that's where things are going. And so really trying to grow that platform, trying to grow a community, trying to give people a different experience around the game. We can talk and we can yell and we can get all upset, but sometimes you want to know if you're going to university of Washington, what's the best burger joint? I had Eldridge Kasner, a former Washington Husky great on last week, and he talked about this burger joint and different things that Big Ten fans could do when they come to the University of Washington. I think those are missing pieces sometimes that need to be filled by people like us that have the insight, that have the connections with these people that can bring uh, Big Ten fans and particularly in particular Illinois fans to a place where they can get some of these things answered that aren't always hardcore basketball stuff. Sometimes it's who's got the best restaurant or if I'm going to university of Oregon and I'm there a day before, what can I get into? Those are the type of things that I think really add color and flavor to a big 10 college basketball experience. So that's what I'm really trying to grow in the future. And I think that at some point that may be what I focus on mainly and maybe cut back on some of the network stuff, but hopefully that's, in the future. I don't have any control of that, but hopefully the networks continue to like my work and, and continue to hire me in that regard. Yeah, that, that's great to hear. And of course, at Illini guys, I'm the resident pizza expert. So that comes from being a, in sales and covering most of the U.S. You, I, I've probably forgotten more pizza than people have eaten and somebody skinny and in good shape like you. Yeah, I have street cred because I got the extra pounds to prove it. <laughs> no, it was great to have you on. And I'd encourage people to go out there and follow Steven's stuff wherever you can. He came on here and we he knew I was going to ask him about this. How do you call the games? And yet here he is in front, smiling and giving us a great answer. 
that's what you want in your media people, somebody who's going to give you an honest assessment and nobody's going to accuse Stephen of uh, not giving his honest opinion at any point in time. <laughs> you got that. I learned that at 312 Canterbury Drive where I grew up. There we are. Atlanta Bardo. Yes. That's sometimes that could be painful being honest. But the truth is the truth. That's right. Folks, we really appreciate having Stephen Bardo on. 